thank you to everyone who's, who's joining us and for an incredibly important conversation today on the challenges facing refugees in this ever uh, and very quickly, rapidly changing environment. Um, for over half a century, Tanzania has been a country of asylum for hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing violence from neighboring countries in the region. There are currently almost 300,000 refugees living in Tanzania's uh, confined and underfunded refugee camps, and over half of them are children. With a weak healthcare system and lack, a lack of basic protective equipment, testing or treatment facilities, and extremely high levels of malnutrition and pre-existing health conditions, today's pandemic is posing an enormous threat to these young children and their families. Last year, funding towards refugee assistance in Tanzania fell, frankly, dramatically short and resulting in massive shortcomings in terms of water, sanitation, shelter, and education for refugees in the country. Uh, and hopefully this conversation can have some impact on changing that. The dire conditions in these refugee camps, the funding gap Tanzania is experiencing currently, the lack of visibility, which is something Concordia is committed to changing, and support on behalf of the international community are serious challenges and will remain so unless we can find a new and innovative way to connect life-saving supplies to, and support to refugees in desperate need. The role of public-private partnerships and grassroots initiatives in tackling these changes is essential to success. With these challenges in mind, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, some visionary leaders and some members of the Concordia community who are thinking about the issues facing refugees and are looking for innovative and sustainable solutions. First, I want to thank my friend Armand Artin uh, and the Artin Capital team for hosting this webinar. Uh, Armand serves as the CEO of Artin Capital as well as a senior advisor to Concordia. He has been a tremendous partner of Concordia over the past few years and a committed partner in furthering our social impact. I know in a little bit, we will be hearing from Wycliffe John. Um, I'll introduce him briefly here, but I think he uh, does not need any formal introduction. Um, but a Grammy award-winning artist, music producer, actor, philanthropist, um, and spent most of his career elevating those who are suffering the hardships of forced migration, refugee crises, and natural disasters, as well as oppressive poverty through his music, public speaking, and his philanthropic work. Uh, I've got to say, I think he sets, he sets a different and new, higher benchmark for others to follow. Uh, I'm also so glad to see uh, Best, Bester Mulazi, who's the Director of Program Development and Quality at Save the Children International, an organization that is also a collaborator, collaborator with Concordia. Um, uh, and, and it's great to have you back, uh, Bester. Uh, Tali Yordanova uh, is also on. She serves as the CEO of Global Citizen Forum and is going to be the moderator of the discussion today. No pressure, Tally. Uh, Global Citizen Forum has also been a tremendous partner of Concordia, and Tally has been driving a driving force for positive dialogue and catalyzing action around forced migration, refugee crisis, and climate change. Um, in closing, uh, responding to this urgent crisis, Global Citizen Forum, in collaboration with Wycliffe and Save the Children, recently launched a collaborative campaign aiming to raise, excuse me, aiming to raise uh, funds uh, for this issue. Actually, a total of $1 million to meet the vital needs of refugee children and families in Tanzania, including proper health, sanitation, nutrition, education, and protection of fundamental human rights. So now is a critical time for cross-sector collaboration, public-private partnerships, and frankly, a more unified world. This virtual discussion will explore how we can build sustainable cross-sector coalitions and leverage the expertise of each sector so that we can find sustainable solutions to address uh, the endemic problems facing refugees in Tanzania. Um, before I pass it off, and then I'll be quiet, uh, a few Zoom housekeeping items. Important, so please pay attention. This shift to digital is not easy for everybody. All attendees are automatically muted uh, when they enter the platform. And so to ask a question during the Q&A, raise your hand and Concordia will unmute you. Use the Q&A feature to ask questions or upvote those submitted by your colleagues. We'll be answering these at the end of the session. Concordia will be monitoring the chat feature, but we do encourage you to use the Q&A platform to ask questions. Feel free to put all of your opinions and thoughts 
into this safe environment and community through the chat feature. But if you have a question, please use the Q&A platform to ask questions. Um, we have a poll, so please complete the poll and help Concordia design content uh, that is of interest to you, our broader member community. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be accessible via the Concordia website for future viewing at www.concordia.net. Uh, the Q&A portion is not going to be recorded, however, um, because that is a special benefit to our members uh, who will be joining live. So with that, I will pass it to you, Tali. Thank you very much, Matthew, uh, for the great introduction. And thank you very much to Concordia for hosting this session. Um, actually, you did half of my work. I was supposed to introduce the topic and the speakers. Oh, uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, it's my exciting. great pleasure. As uh, Matthew mentioned, my name is Tali. I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of the Global Citizen Forum, and I've been working with the, with the organization since its uh, very inception. Uh, just a few words on the GCF uh, as an organization. It's, uh, the GCF is a Canadian uh, non-profit, non-partisan organization committed to um, advancing the agenda for global citizenship across five pillars. Governance, mobility and migration, culture and identity, uh, technology and uh, um, sustainability. The main focus of our work is to bridge dialogue with action where we host a series of high level events and discussions um, uh, throughout the year and uh, on the action front we partner with various um, uh, grassroots organizations that are instrumental in addressing global challenges on a micro scale um, on the ground. The refugee crisis is a crisis that the GCF holds very dear to its heart and uh, is completely embedded in everything that we do. Uh, we believe that the world um, exists in a context of complete interconnectedness already and um, true global mindset can be, cannot be achieved unless mobility and migration are treated as um, equally distributed public goods, which is very far from the case right now. As uh, I'm sure um, all of the attendees and the audience today is aware, the, refu the refugee crisis is probably the biggest failure of migration and uh, is so complex in its nature that solving it has also not been much of a success. Um, but this is where the role of civil society and international community really uh, comes in with a very, um, very strong um, impact that this group of organizations can, can really bring to the vulnerable communities and the people that are suffering from uh, these conditions. As Matthew mentioned, the GCF has recently embarked on a fundraising initiative to, with an ambitious but we believe achievable goal to raise uh, $1 million to support two refugee camps in Tanzania. Um, with, um, you know, helping them to obviously close the massive uh, funding gap that they're experiencing at the moment and to, to also prepare um, the communities for the um, catastrophic effects that the global pandemic can have on, on the local operations. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I have an um, absolutely amazing panel here today. Um, we are um, probably going to have Wyclef join any minute now, but I would like to start with um, with uh, uh, Bester. Sorry, to, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you upgrade um, uh, a preacher from uh, the attendees? This is Wyclef. Yeah, just oh. join. Thank you. I believe we have we have Wyclef on. Hello. We don't see you. Okay, could y'all see me now? No. No. Okay, I'll figure out how to y'all could see me. Y'all could keep going. But it's really me. Someone please call 911. It's really me. <laughs> We I will find it. All right, I'll find it. Okay, here we go. Y'all should see me now. Yes. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be with y'all. Sorry I'm late. If I told y'all what happened to me, y'all would say why Clef is using the excuse that the dog ate my homework, so I won't get into it. <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here for the cause. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, we were just, you didn't miss much. We were just giving a, a round of introductions and an overview of the topic. Um, we're going to start the discussion with uh, Bester Malauzi, who's from Tanzania, and he's working on the ground with refugee camps there. Um, Bester is uh, Director of Program Development and Quality for Tanzania for Save the Children, and he has a um, uh, vast experience in humanitarian aid, working in Malawi, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, and uh, currently in Tanzania. So Bester, as uh, Matthew mentioned at the beginning of the introduction, there is almost 300,000 displaced people living in confined and severely underfunded refugee camps in Tanzania at the moment. Um, you're there, you're on the ground, you see it every day. Can you please tell us um, in more, with more details, what is the current situation in the country and particularly what is the reality in the refugee camps and the children that are living there today? Uh, what does it look like? Um, thanks, Tali, and uh, thank you um, for having me on this webinar. And it's a pleasure to join uh, Mr. Wycliffe Sean, uh, Mr. Armand Arten, uh, two distinguished gentlemen, um, to talk about a topic I know um, is very dear to their hearts. Um, as Matt said in the introduction, uh, we call the Tanzania refugee situation a forgotten crisis um, because very few around the world know that Tanzania currently hosts over, uh, close to 300,000. Um, registered refugees and asylum seekers, uh, most of whom are Burundian and uh, a sizable population uh, from Congo. And the majority uh, seek refuge in uh, three refugee camps in northwestern uh, region of, ta of Tanzania called Kigoma. Um, and of these 300,000, around 50%, uh, over 50% of the refugees are children. As for the conditions in the camps, um, almost 50% of the refugees and asylum seekers across all the camps continue to live in inadequate in emergency shelters and tents for an extended period of time. And this leads um, to unacceptable living conditions and increased risk of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, most recently, um, all the refugees in Tanzania have been under uh, stringent restrictions in their mobility um, to move outside the camps. And this predates um, the COVID outbreak. And um, they're also not allowed to take part in income generating activities, which makes it very difficult um, for vulnerable refugees to meet their basic needs. Um, this wasn't the case before. Um, so these two policies have severely hindered the ability of refugees to create sustainable livelihood opportunities and have increased the difficulty um, of finding diversified food and services. Um, and this further uh, is com uh, compounding poverty at household level has led to negative coping mechanisms um, that the, the refugees have to take. And this is leading to um, early marriage, child labor, and increased um, violence and sexual violence. Um, and this is also mainly due to the psychological stress that um, the refugees are, are facing. Um, the levels of neglect, both uh, with uh, children, with their families, and uh, foster care arrangements is a concern. Uh, we also see that women and children uh, experience uh, the brunt of these, protect, uh, of these protection and the risks in their homes, schools, and communities um, are, are very bad. And has there been any um, any changes during the um, um, you know the current situation with the global pandemic and uh, the complications this created? How how ha have the refugee camps been affected by that? Fortunately, we've not had an outbreak in the camps yet, um, which is very fortunate because apart from the, the, the threat of COVID, um, in, neighbor, in neighboring uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, you also have an active Ebola outbreak still going on at the moment, and as well as measles outbreak, which has actually reached the camps. And so that's a big risk. And the fact that 60% uh, of the households do actually share uh, toilets um, and share uh, hygiene and wash facilities is actually brings that risk. So you can't social distance, you can't uh, shield elderly from, um, from children and others because you're just in a confined uh, setting. Of course, of course. Thank you so much for giving this overview. And uh, of course, thank you for the, the amazing work that you're doing on the ground, because I'm sure it's uh, very challenging. I, I would like to turn to our dear friend Wyclef now. 
Wyclef, once again, thank you so much for joining us and uh, thanks for supporting this initiative and the fundraiser that we're putting together. Uh, you've been a friend to the GCF and uh, supporters since its very beginning and uh, not only that, a uh, great voice for um, the refugee uh, communities around the world and you have uh, supported and uh, advocated for their rights for many, many years. Um, I would like to ask you, um, why did you choose to join this initiative and why are you supporting it and uh, why do you find it so dear to your heart? Thank you, everybody. And uh, it's an honor once again to be with y'all on the call. And I just want to start by giving everybody a virtual hug, you know what I'm saying? Giving everybody virtual love out there. Um, for me, the, the cause of a refugee has been a cause for me from the start. Um, I was born in Haiti um, under extreme uh, poverty. Um, and at the time we had what was called the baby doc era. And this is after um, his father, Papa Doc was reigning. So the next dictator in line was baby doc. So within that, you had what was called a, a migration of Haitians that were literally flooding the Cuban shore waters and heading to Miami, you know? And at this time you had um, a lot of families that were dying at sea. And so I had family that literally tried to get to Miami and never made it. And this reality of when people have to flee because of circumstances, right? They're not fleeing because they are trying to go on a vacation it's literally like they're fleeing for their lives. You know what I mean? So usually what I find out is people don't look at them as people because if you looked at them as people, then people within senates and parliaments would fight for policies that really concern these issues. And we have found that these people are turned away usually um, back to where they come from, or they suffer beyond extreme, humane difficulties that not even animals would go through. And I'm speaking firsthand. So one of the things that I've done in my early days, um, my group, which is called Fuji's, is short for refugees. So I'm, I'm, this is not something that This is not something that, you know, I just woke up today and said, let me do, you know, I'm 50 years old now. So this is a cause. I know I, I look younger, baby, but I'm 50. This is, this is a cause that I've been fighting for since I've been 17 years old. And so I think it's important as we move towards the future. One thing um, people used to say is, man, you live in Brooklyn. I remember these words. Why are you so worried about Africa, for example, you know? Um, you live in New Jersey, you know? Why are you worried about Haiti? And what I used to tell them is, have you ever looked at the world from a satellite point of view? Uh, and if you do, then you'll understand that we all are people and everything is cause and effect. So within cause and effect, if we don't act and we don't do something and we don't find a way to say, you know what? we're gonna affect policy. We're gonna make the politicians see it in a different way, right? So it's like, it's bigger than raising $1 million, right? Because when we raise the million dollars, what we wanna do is we wanna alert the powers that be like, y'all really have to do more. And so for me, uh, this is something that's dear uh, to my heart. Um, one probably story I could probably share with y'all, heavy refugee story for me um, is I don't, I don't think people understand the reality of the, the, the fleeing, you know, part, because I, I don't, I, you have to understand, like imagine the, how fortunate we are having families and saying, okay, you know, we decide to get on a boat and go somewhere. You know, we decide that. 
we decide to get on a plane and go somewhere. We are deciding this. But the idea of within seconds, you harboring your children, your wife, your husband, and then you lead to a place of complete darkness because you don't have, I just want y'all to take a second. Imagine you in this position, like the word scary, you can't even imagine that. It, it, so this is like, we have to fight for this cause because we are, it's like when we're fighting for them, we're fighting for ourselves. And so to me, uh, once again, I'm honored and I look forward to giving 100% of my soul to the cause of refugees till I pass away. That's just um, a natural thing for me um, coming where I come from. It's a, it's a, an obligation. And I think that we people that have means, it is an obligation that we do better. So thank you for having me and y'all can count on me 100%. Thank you so much, Wycliffe, and uh, honestly, I wish there were more people like you out there because what you're saying is completely true, and it's true the hardship and the, um, and the trauma and the stress that uh, refugee families go through is absolutely unimaginable, and it's very difficult for someone to put themselves in their shoes, fleeing, but not only fleeing, also settling in the refugee camps and uh, spending Bester, how many years on average does a refugee child spend uh, in the camps in Tanzania? Um, we have, uh, the majority of refugees have been there around three to five years, but then you have Congolese refugees who have been in those camps for 15 years. Children who were born in the camps are now 14 years old, still staying in those refugee camps. Yeah. So this is a reality which is uh, very difficult to grasp and very difficult to, you know, come to terms with, let's say. Um, but uh, we have a role to play and, uh, and it's important that we work together and we collaborate. And I'm sure that the, the, you know, the civil society has a lot to offer to, I don't think we can solve the crisis, but we can uh, try to alleviate it in uh, one way or another. I would like to turn to Armand now. Uh, Armand is a, a, a really great example, I would say, definitely personally for me as a professional, but I think uh, in the context of uh, being a, you know, a global leader and a business uh, uh, entrepreneur and an activist at the same time, I think Armand uh, really encompasses this bridge between um, uh, actually this transition from for-profit to profit with purpose. And um, um, I think Armand really understands very well the role that uh, you know private sector um, uh, plays in the in this entire context. So Armand, could you share with us what is your view from your experience? You have a very vast experience already in terms of the shortages uh, on behalf of governments, the shortages on behalf of the private sector, and the shortages on behalf of international organizations as well. And how do you think? Uh, your, uh, you know, the role of the private sector can be strengthened. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tali. Um, thank you, uh, Matthew from Concordia, Wycliffe and, and Bester for uh, being part of this uh, initiative and for, for allowing me to, um, to help uh, as much as we can as well. As uh, your brother Wycliffe said, it's, um, it, it all starts personal. It starts with your own life and with your own experience. And, some of the best initiatives, some of the most successful businessmen, as well as activists, um, have started from a very single story from their personal life that have pushed them and they have pushed boundaries around the world. My block of, uh, of Europe, of Bulgaria at the time, um, we didn't go to refugee camps, but um, you know the whole Eastern Bloc was a refugee camp um, with very limited uh, access to the rest of the world, with very much controlled information. So my youth was uh, uh, really very different from what my kids are spending today. And um, as every parent, um, as every human being, what you want is a better future for your own children. Um, so living through, um, you know, through the end of the, the, the communist time and seeing the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall um, and, and living in three, four countries before I turned into the age of 20 and start my career in Canada, um, 
from a first hand, I really realized that even though none of us have ever chose the place of birth, um, that's pretty much the only thing that you can control. Um, everything else, it's within the power of your belief, of your determination, and can be changed. And yet, and yet that uh, place of birth determines so much, even if you become a successful like Wyclef and the other side of the world, um, and, and you make history, and, and um, you're, you, you still carry that little passport that limits so much about where you can go and what you can do. And, and Brother Wycliffe knows that firsthand, asking you know, for visas in many countries, even being a celebrity as he is until recently. Um, so the success, is, it's a very funny word. It's, it's determined in, in everybody's own understanding of what it is success. Um, but for me personally, being uh, somebody that wants to help people um, move freely around the world has become my personal mission. On a corporate level, our company works with many governments on, on uh, migration policies, attracting of investments. But on a personal level, I think that we all have a responsibility not to forget where we are from. Uh, and we tend to do that very often. Um, we tend to forget where our parents come from. And now we maybe complain about wearing masks or not wearing masks when our grandparents, um, you know, starved through the Second World War, um, through the famines of, of, um, of some of the worst disasters they have seen. Um, and, uh, and yet they have succeeded and they have provided to, to you know, our parents and our parents have provided to us. Um, so I think we need to uh, think a little bit different and, and um, very well, you know, as uh, Wycliffe said, is when you look at, at, the, at Earth from the, from, from the cosmos, no borders, no lines. Um, we, we're seen as one and yet we don't act as one. It takes something like the pandemic for us to really reshape our way of thinking of communicating and of taking care. Um, so why Tanzania and why this project, even though the cases in Africa are not as big as um, uh, cases in, in uh, United States or, or other countries in uh, Asia uh, or Middle East, uh, we believe that putting efforts in advance and preparing, especially the most vulnerable people in, in the refugee camps, and uh, as Bester said, in average they spend 17 years. Um, you know, we, we spend uh, three months in, in the comfort of our rooms and choosing between Netflix and popcorn and other media tools where those children will spend not three months, 17 years in a confinement of a single tent without um, basic necessities, without um, having the medical equipment necessary, without having the, uh, the sewage and, and uh, the basic things that we don't think about it. And those things can make a change in their life in terms of life or death because pandemics like the Ebola, like uh, uh, the COVID, uh, will only be roaming in, I think, more accelerated rate around the world because of the nature we are. We will travel more, we will expand, and the way that our parents used to travel 100 years ago or 50 years ago is not the way we travel now. And look at the world when we stop. Um, everything stops and, and the economy collapses and, and uh, politics uh, will be changed. So. Um, I think we need to be more sensible. We need to be more human. And I think we all have a act, as actors of our society, a role to play. Being on a corporate side, being on a personal side, um, we can help with not financially only contribution, but providing the access and the platform of where you stand and what you can do for those kids. Um, and for, for these people, because you know they are kids now, tomorrow they'll be teenagers and tomorrow they'll be adults and they're still gonna be in these refugee camps. So let's not forget that and let's try to help with what we can, um, bring the attention and the focus through the digital world we all live in today. Um, and as much as I love to... ...to save their lives. And thank you for Save the Children uh, of helping to reach out to uh, as many people as we do through Concordia and really make a difference. Thank you, Armand, for, um, for, your, um, for your contribution and for the, the amazing work that um, <clears throat> we were able to do together. Um, Bester, I would uh, like to come back to you. Um, we are uh, trying to raise a million dollars for two refugee camps in, uh, in Tanzania to support the children in those camps. Um, 
As you can see from the organizers of the fundraisers, we're going to give 100% of ourselves, of our effort and our focus to achieve that goal. Tell us what, how can $1 million make a difference in, uh, in Tanzania? Um, thanks, Sam. That's a, a, a lovely question. Uh, you know, when we ask children, because we regularly consult and engage children in the camps, and when you ask the children the same question, what do you need? What are your biggest needs? Um, you'd be surprised. They're in very dire situations. They most likely haven't had a full meal, but they say education. Um, they would say that the education is their most pressing need. I think they look at education as their way out to break out of the situation they're in permanently. And so um, that's education is what they really want. And for your information, Tali, um, there are about 90,000 school going, children of school going age in the camps. Of those 10,000 are completely out of school. They're, they're not in school. And for those that are actually are, are in school, uh, many are still studying under trees um, due to shortage of uh, classrooms and overcrowding. Um, the schools also lack, as I said, toilets. Um, and this really has negative consequences on girls' education, as you know, and also education for children with disabilities. Um, they end up dropping out because there's just not enough facilities such, such as that. Um, the schools also lack teachers. Learning materials are not there. So there's not, not enough learning materials. They don't have enough um, qualified teachers. And again, these are the things that force children to drop out. Um, on a more serious also need is protection, child protection. And you might, you, there are about 5,000 children who are unaccompanied and separated um, from their parents and guardians. So 5,000 children in the camps who do not have any parents or guardians. And this, these children um, are in very vulnerable states and they're, they're subjected to a lot of abuse, uh, neglect and exploitation um, because of that. And that's something that we also work towards trying to unify um, children, trying to case manage, find out who, um, where their parents are and try to connect them using various partners. Um, even for the children that do have guardians, um, we've noticed recently um, in, in the schools and child-friendly spaces that we support, that a lot of children are going to school looking very miserable. They're unkempt, um, showing a lot of signs of neglect. And so you can also see that a lot of children are being subjected to violence, gender-based violence. And that's also manifested by the high rates of teenage pregnancies that we now have in the camps. So we really need to also look at the protection angle um, trying to protect children um, who are very vulnerable in the camps. A lot of this stems from the fact that um, when you are in the camps, the, the situation forces you to, uh, to have psychosocial problems and uh, mental health problems a lot. And we're experiencing that a lot among our beneficiaries, both old and young. And so we also support uh, mental and psychosocial support um, for children, especially. Uh, we have child psychologists, and that's something that we need to strengthen because we just don't have enough people. We're not able to reach um, as, as many children as, as we possibly could should we have had funding. And the, even we're failing to meet uh, over like 30%, 40% of the children. And with the reduction in funding, that's really going to drop. Our reach is going to really drop because we don't have um, the funding available um, to reach all the children that are vulnerable. So as vulnerabilities are increasing, the funding is decreasing, which is a precarious situation. What is the reason for that? Um, the funding, as I said earlier, it's a forgotten crisis. I think the funders from uh, Europe, the West, who used to support um, refugee responses, shifted their response and started supporting their own refugee crisis that, that came up in Europe, for example. And mm -hmm. so they're focusing on that. And now with the COVID outbreak, a lot of countries are reducing their donor funding and looking internally and trying to tackle their needs um, on the ground. And I think that's why even the humanitarian partnerships and the, the organizations which have been traditionally supporting and working um, in refugee response, we actually need to introspect and look at how do we bring in other partners. And that's why we're really excited about this partnership with, uh, with, with the Global Citizen Forum, um, Wycliffe John and others um, to try to bring in new people to support this need because the gaps are so big. Yes. If I may uh, just add um, that um, uh, we have seen with uh, other international organizations that uh, in, uh, in the beginning of this crisis, 
Uh, and I think we're only in the beginning of the financial crisis. Um, definitely, uh, philanthropy will be affected as well. Um, people will start uh, reducing by the end of this year, um, estimated 30 to 40 percent their philanthropic uh, contributions on the personal level. Companies will do the same. Um, so, except few tech companies and maybe pharmaceutical who uh, might and should increase their uh, CSR responsibility and budgets. I think the rest of the world will definitely retract and will have less funds to donate. Um, same thing with international organizations who uh, you know, don't know where to put the priority between all the countries, small islands and developing nations asking for uh, funds and, and support. So um, I think 2021 will be very uh, different economically uh, as, a, as, a, as a year and will be very challenging uh, to find the financial support that we need. That's why I think we need to prepare from now and, and have the base necessary uh, to support uh, this project. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, I hope more and more organizations follow, uh, follow and uh, I hope Tanzania sees more and more support because it seems that uh, the level of, uh, it, it's severely overlooked, not only in terms of funding, but also in terms of visibility and recognition from the international community. So. Hopefully we can help on that front as well with the work that we're doing and with YCLEF's endorsement and, uh, and support. Um, YCLEF, I, I, I would like to turn back to you again. Um, I know you love children and I know uh, you're a um, strong supporter of the cause as we already mentioned. Um, in normal circumstances, I would really love for us to visit those camps and for these children to be able to see you and talk to you because I'm sure you're a superhero to them. But these are not so normal circumstances and hopefully one day we can do that, but for now we, we can't. So I wanted to ask you, if you had a chance to talk to one of these kids in the camp, what would you tell them? Um, so um, first thing I want to say is I, I really, want to thank the brother because one of my concerns right is always security in these camps right because raising funds is one thing but securing the children is something different this is like so devastating because where i come from in haiti um one of the things that i've done in my early days when i had my foundation yearly was in every favela, I hired a task force. So literally, I took the bad boys and I made them the security. And was like, if anything happened to any of these kids, y'all are now responsible. Because what happens is, raising money is one thing. Securing life is another. And so that definitely touched me because we have to do everything that we can to protect these kids. Because when we read the reports, the way a lot of different countries, these kids are being abused, um, automatically depression, psycho, I, I, I heard you talking about psychiatrists, all of this made me feel good. So I wanted off, to, uh, off by saying that. So now, so to my kid, and if I was to say something, and you could translate it later, so one day there was a man, right? But he was a little tiny boy and he lived in a small village. And in this village, he didn't have anything to eat. At times for weeks, he had no access to water. When he wanted water, him and his grandma got on a donkey and they would go for miles and miles and miles till they get the water. And then they would come back to the village and this went on for days and days. So one day, this little boy gathered every little kid in the village and he said, guess what? From now on, we will no longer be hungry. We will no longer be thirsty. And the kids are like, how? I mean, we, we have nothing. So we are going to be hungry. He says, no. You have the will of God. 
And the God that has created you will never let you finish like that. So you have to believe and have faith and have faith because tomorrow is going to be a brighter day. Nine times out of 10, tell the kids when they are telling this story, someone's going to say, man, you're making this up. It don't exist. Then you tell them in the village that it does exist because there was a young man from the small village of Haiti and his name is Wyclef Jean today. So that's what I want you to translate and let all the kids know. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish we have a chance to really visit uh, the beautiful country of Tanzania and, uh, and the camps and have a chance to really speak to the children and give them that piece of inspiration and um, hope for the future. Um, I think uh, we'd like to uh, open the floor for some questions from the audience. Um, I believe the Concordia team is uh, uh, collecting some questions from, from the attendees on the, on the panel. Let me, uh, let me just, uh, Matthew, are you still on the call? Okay. I think he's left. All right. Um, sorry, just a second. Okay. While I find the questions, because I'm sorry, I can't really see them, um, I'll ask. Um, I'll ask Armand to share um, his experience from uh, visiting the camps and meeting the children because Armand, I know you've worked in the past with children projects in, uh, in Jordan and uh, in the impact and the joy that this brings. So if you want, you uh, could share the story with us. Uh, with pleasure. And um, it's true that the last five years since 2015, uh, the world has much more focus on the European um, crisis of refugees and um, all the Middle East and Africa, North African people trying to cross uh, the Mediterranean. So since the last five years, uh, our organizations, um, Art and Capital, as well as Global Citizen Forum, have uh, started a few initiatives to support small or big projects uh, related mainly to um, refugee camps in the Middle East. Um, and this is why I think that uh, the whole world did this and they kind of forgot about the refugee camps in the rest of the world, you know, from uh, uh, Southeast Asia to, to Africa, where uh, actually many more people are living and struggling for much longer than, uh, than uh, the camps in, uh, in Jordan or Lebanon. Uh, but what I saw from first hand in, uh, in um, uh, Jordan, in uh, Azra camp, uh, was uh, kids, the kids were just uh, flown um, the, the war in Syria and um, uh, some of them, you know, had the terrible um, stories that, you know, would only live in um, seen in movies and, and parents lost the brothers and sisters. Um, and, and those kids would have a smile and a laugh and a happiness and a joy uh, that, uh, as I said, you know, um, our, uh, spoiled brat kids, you know, will need a, an iPad or a new toy. And, and they just were happy to see people, to friendly, to, uh, to play with them. And um, we built caravans of joy, which is uh, uh, containers that were modified for the kids uh, filled with toys. And we also find those parents or adults in the camps that had educational background to actually um, supervise the kids and, and provide from the early age, six years to 14 years old, Um, and my first fear was that, oh my God, but these kids, as soon as we opened the doors, you know, they were lining up um, an hour to, to wait and there was limited time. And uh, I was afraid that they all going to leave um, with the toys. And there was, you know, a limited number of things we couldn't bring per container. Uh, to my surprise, uh, three months later, most of these toys were, were still there and shared. And um, the fact that those kids had nothing and they 
kept those toys and shared them with hundreds of other kids and they didn't try to steal them and take them away or take away these moments of joy for, for their other friends on, in the camp. Um, you know, I was telling so much about what kind of men mental situation they, they have been in, uh, what kind of spirit and, and will they have. So um, I haven't had the privilege and, and the honor to visit the camps in, uh, in, in Tanzania and I look forward one day to do it. Uh, but I'm very much sure I'm going to see the same smiles and the same look in the eyes uh, because they all share this um, this drive of sharing, this compassion that not many kids have around the world. And I believe that some of them one day will be our leaders. Some of them will hold positions in organizations, will be presidents of countries. Um, and I just hope that one day, you know, the world will be will be driven by people like that. Absolutely. I'm absolutely certain and uh, I truly believe in that. So, um, okay, we got one question from the audience from John. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the surname properly, ben Benitez. Um, his question is, what's been the biggest challenge you encounter in making the case for helping refugees? I'd say um, we, can, we can ask Bester first and then, of course, Armand. Um, thanks. Um, once again, that's a great question. And um, as I mentioned earlier, it's the competition for the, the limited resources out there um, for humanitarian support, uh, especially refugees. And it's sort of like you're competing with, um, as I said, the European refugee crisis. You're also competing against more um, more popular um, response. Um, emergencies in Somalia, Yemen, which um, already attract a lot of media attention. And now with uh, the COVID outbreak, it's even going to be worse because that's what's getting all the attention. And so we foresee that there are going to be much more challenges than we already have. Absolutely. Armand, what about your experience? Because we, we've worked a lot on making the case for the refugee cause. So what would you say are the biggest challenges? I, I, the problem is perception, and I think it's, um, uh, as we said before, I think uh, migration needs rebranding. Um, uh, people forget the benefits of, um, of these people in the move. They see them as cost and not um, as, as an investment. Um, they, they think they, they steal jobs or um, they bring in security when actually uh, they bring multiculturalism, history, and, and contribute to society much more than uh, um, what you know, people, people see now. So the challenge is, is, is this, is extreme right views from different political parties all around the world who, uh, um, you know, it's very easy to scare population uh, instead of um, defending you know, migration and, and bringing support to, to refugees. So um, that's the challenge we have, um, rebranding the benefits of refugees and, and completely changing the conversation from negative to positive. Um, uh, I'm not saying that there is no criminality. I'm not saying that there is not, uh, of course, a uh, financial challenge of hosting uh, countries when uh, they, they, they're in such a situation. Um, but in the long term, uh, the benefits absolutely, absolutely uh, outpass the, the costs. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, on behalf of Wyclef, he had to leave because uh, there was a, um, another engagement and uh, he asked to say goodbye to everyone on his behalf and uh, he thanks us one more time for having him. Um, Armand, we have another question to you. You just spoke of the drive and compassion of youth that uh, you've, um, you've witnessed. Uh, which is uh, also demonstrating matur maturity beyond years. What would, um, what would you like to see from elected leaders in the global community at this time? What would be the number one priority from political leaders in Tanzania, Africa, and the global community if they could change one policy or movement process? This question is from Hannah Dalmat, Senior Director, Partnership Development at Concordia. Uh, thank you for the question. I um, believe that uh, leaders today, uh, it doesn't matter if they're political or um, business leaders, um, they need to respond to the crisis with much more humanity and um, 
compassion and um, less of egos and less of me. It's more of we. Um, I think, uh, again, um, I, I deplore when I see politicians or corporate leaders using the crisis to cut costs or, again, to uh, control and vehicle the message uh, in a way for them to gain political or financial gains. Um, just, you know, I think we have to think less about us uh, and, and what we can uh, make out of it or how we can survive it and, uh, and think about the others. Esther, actually, I'd like to uh, extend the same question to you, but in the context of the Tanzanian government in particular, what policies do you think need to be put in place so that the situation can, can be alleviated? I wouldn't say resolved. I wouldn't use that word. Yeah, no, and uh, we are, as organizations, advocating for this um, improvement in policies, both at country level and also regional. The, the, the biggest issue is to allow um, and this, we've seen this in other neighboring countries where refugees are actually allowed um, to assimilate or uh, assimilate within the host communities or get jobs or have uh, or come up with a livelihood at least while they remain as refugees, they come up with a livelihood um, where they can fend for themselves and can actually be productive citizens, uh, productive um, individuals um, for the country. And that now releases the burden and also improves what uh, Armand talked about where people do not see them as a burden to the country, but actually you see what they contribute because a lot of these refugees come up with unique things, unique, they also bring unique skills um, from where they're coming from and do a culture, rich culture and, and the like. So we actually are advocating for government to change policies around um, assimilation of uh, refugees, allowing them to, to gain some employment ex um, within the country or to, to engage in uh, income generating activities around the camps. Um, to improve their uh, livelihoods. Thank you for your answer. Um, with that, I would like to wrap up the discussion. Uh, for anyone uh, that is interested in the fundraising initiative and campaign that we have been running uh, in collaboration with Save the Children UK, uh, please um, follow the link which will be shared in after the um, after the webinar, and also you can visit the website of the GCF to see ways you can get involved. Um, this is, a, as everyone on the, on the panel mentioned, is a cause that can be supported in many ways. It doesn't uh, necessarily have to be funding, but also uh, raising awareness and advocating and amplifying the message of the Tanzanian, like we call them the forgotten children in Tanzania, is already something, is already of great benefit and great importance for, for their future and for their livelihood. I would like to thank once again Concordia for hosting, um, for hosting this session and for supporting our mission to, uh, to drive the dialogue and uh, action towards uh, the refugee children in Tanzania. And I would like to thank um, uh, the great panel and the speakers, Armand Darton and Bester Malauzi for sharing their views and their experience in, in, in the field and on the ground. Thank you once again. It was a pleasure having you. It was a pleasure talking to you, and um, and I hope we'll um, uh, we'll make um, uh, change happen together. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you, Tali, and thanks everyone as well. Thanks, Armand. <laughs>